Hello and welcome to this video on Merlinda Bobus's Locust Girl. This is one of several installments in a kind of mini lecture series, all of which revolve around this novel by the award winning Filipino Australian writer. In this video, we will explore the intersection of fantastic literature, which allegedly depicts escapist worlds, and mimetic fiction, whose main concern is to reflect the real world, as far as Bobus's 2015 novel is concerned. This intersection is present within multiple issues represented in Locust Girl, chief among them the dynamics between the Five Kingdoms and its inhabitants, the so-called carers, and the so-called wasters or strays living in the inhospitable desert regions. This is a constellation which can be likened to various real-world political imbalances, as we will see while we progress. Even the paratextual elements hint at the novel's engagement with the refugee crisis, for example. As Bobus's dedication reads, For those walking to the border for dear life, and those guarding the border for dear life. Interestingly, Bobus's dedication addresses not only the refugees, but also the border guards, which is an unexpected, though nuanced approach to the issue at hand. It is reflected best within the novel through the figure of Verompe, who is himself a liminal character. He belongs both to the wasters and to the carers, through his mother and his father respectively, and thus arguably has reasons to identify with both sides of the border. This kind of approach recognizes the humanity of the border guards and perhaps enables a reflection of their role as negative without condemning them as inhumane or monstrous, which can often be an issue with fantasy texts, as those of you who are genre savvy will immediately recognize. The initial description of Amedea's situation in the tent city is also clearly designed to resemble inhumane treatment often suffered by refugees in real-life refugee camps. As Amidea reports, We lived in a desert of many tents, our halfway homes between heaven and earth, the blue box said, so we should be grateful. The halfway homes here refer to the liminal state of refugees in camps or detention centres, especially the offshore version Australia is infamous for, in which the refugees are not granted citizenship and instead exist in a sort of limbo of waiting, waiting to be processed. The way the refugees are treated in Locust Girl is especially chilling. They are given numbered tattoos and as a German lecturer recording this video in Germany and for a German university seminar in the first instance, this ought to send up immediate red flags. Amidea continues, I was in my blue dress, also rationed, like the number and letter inscribed just beneath my right ear, 425A in blue ink. I was the daughter of number 425, living in tent 425, where there was no 425B or C or D. I was his only daughter and I did not have a mother. She would have been 425 in brackets a creature forever hidden like all the other mothers who I hardly saw. Not only is everything strictly rationed and controlled by the Five Kingdoms, even the tattoos given to the refugees, there's also an allusion to gender depression in the camps, as the mother, where she's still alive, would literally be in brackets, not existing outside of the tent at all, that is, the minimal home that the refugee families have, Instead, she would remain unseen, literally restricted to the sphere of the home, the interior of the tent, and to invisibility. The camp is then destroyed, most likely bombed, and Amidea retreats into the earth, which is called her bed or burial ground, and is only saved by the charred bodies above. When she emerges ten years later, it is with the locust embedded in her forehead and with it the songs of all the refugees she has known so far and those that she will come to know throughout her journey over the course of the novel. Her first encounter is with B. Nabe, a young girl, about 16, who has broken one of the most important rules provided to the wasters in the form of a song. 
No one should look. No one should walk beyond the horizon. This is clearly propaganda, and it is distributed by the five kingdoms in order to serve multiple purposes. It is meant to prevent people like Binabe, wasters in five kingdom ideology, from leaving their own limited camps and thus risk witnessing the devastation inflicted upon people in a very similar camp, Amidea's people, only 10 years ago and not very far away. In addition to that, it is also meant to stop people to look towards the five kingdoms and march there in hopes of a better life, as the wasters are not supposed to hope. They are meant to stay where they are and wait for the rations delivered to them by their so-called generous carers. Eventually, though, even Binabe's home is equally destroyed, showcasing that life in the refugee camps is precarious and always at the mercy of, in this case, the five kingdoms or the respective hosting communities, if we were to put the situation into a real-world context. Even just a rumour of possible dissent, and dissent is often just the form of a song, that that is enough to prompt utter destruction. Scholar Dolores Herrero makes the connections between the novel and actual Australian asylum and refugee politics explicit by comparing the conditions in Low Caste Girl to Australia's offshore detention. In doing so, she refers to Paul Stevenson, a well-known Australian psychologist who claims the Australian government is deliberately inflicting upon people the worst trauma he has ever seen. In an interview with The Guardian, Stevenson says about offshore detention that you don't see the positive glimpses, you don't see the strength of resilience, you don't see the quirky little things that people do when the chips are down, you don't see the laughter and you don't see the bravery, and you don't see any of those things that give hope for improvement in the lives of these people. Every day is demoralizing. Every single day and every night. And you can work an 8-hour shift, or a 16-hour shift, or a 20-hour shift. You can get up in the middle of the night to answer the calls to go down to the camp, and you know it's not getting any better. And it's that demoralization that is the paramount feature of offshore detention. It's indeterminate, it's under terrible, terrible conditions, and there is nothing you can say about it that says there's some positive humanity in this. And that's why it's such an atrocity. As you can see, Australia's policies with regard to its treatment of refugees have come under a lot of public criticism, most prominently with the publication of the Nauru Files, a set of leaked documents published from inside Australia's immigration detention system. These are still publicly available and I will link to them in the description of this video. Amnesty International has a whole subsection of its website dedicated to Nauru. Again, I will link this in the description. And the Refugee Council of Australia also criticizes the practice of offshore processing, as it is called, on their website. Uh, here is a quote. Refugees leave their homes because they are in danger there. They should be protected, not punished. Offshore processing aims to stop people trying to come to Australia for protection by boat. Instead of reaching safety, they end up detained in remote places in terrible conditions. For years, they have been in limbo. They live in extremely poor conditions and are vulnerable to abuse. The suffering has been enormous. The evidence of abuse, including sexual abuse, has been overwhelming. 13 people have died, including through neglect and suicide. Their health care is very poor. Their mental health is worse than those of people in refugee camps. Now, before I go back to discussion of the novel rather than the issues it so explicitly criticizes, I'd like to draw your attention to this testimony by a refugee whose resonances with Locust Girl will likely be immediately evident. Empty, numb, confused, lost. Who are we? Who am I? No one. What are we? What am I? Nothing. A number? Maybe. The number of a boat. IVL 57. 
as you can see, Bobus has portrayed a very similar experience when assigning Amadea a number, suggesting that there is this loss of humanity through the processing, both by the Five Kingdoms and by the Australian government, when it does things like this, assigning numbers to people, thus reducing their experiences to something that is just not human, that is reduced to a number rather than uh, an individual fate. There are numerous other ways in which the narrative, though it does incorporate generic elements from dystopian fiction, magical realism and fantasy, depicts journeys that would not be out of place in the life writing of refugees today. As Herrero puts it, Amidea's journey to the border teems with horrors and echoes those undertaken by so many desperate refugees nowadays. The novel portrays danger, hunger, cruelty and fear. Body parts are traded, fathers and mothers disappear, never to be seen again. Children are scarce and left to die of hunger. Color-coded boxes relentlessly declaim the party line. Border protection mechanisms are fierce and determine who is to live or die. Greed and ecological folly destroy natural resources which only a privileged, thoughtless few can enjoy. Arguably, at the point in the novel The Locust Girl, natural resources already are largely destroyed. The privileged few enjoy the few remaining fertile patches of land and the colours representing a form of biodiversity that has been lost throughout most of the desertified land are now only available to the inhabitants of the Five Kingdoms. They do now seem to vigorously control consumption, but only after it is too late, and at the expense of those not included in the Five Kingdoms society. The Five Kingdoms' wealth is explicitly shown to be stolen from other less privileged groups, as the tale of Chuchuli illustrates. The old woman lives alone in a cave, which she has filled with water through her tears. Notice the magical realist element here. She tells her story in the manner of a fairy tale, albeit a gruesome one. Once upon a time, my cheeks were dry, my eyes were dry. Once upon a time, I had a husband and two children, a boy and a girl. Once upon a time, their cheeks were dry, their eyes were dry. Chochuli explains how a village used to be green with a well that was able to provide the whole village, including the animals, with water, but then the people from the Five Kingdoms came and took the water away under the pretense of safeguarding it. Then the good men and women came to our village once upon a time. They came to tell us we had too much water and we were wasteful. We had to save water for the future. So they built pipes into our well and our water disappeared. Once upon a time, the good men and women said they were the keepers of water. Once upon a time, they said that our water was somewhere safe now for the future, and they promised to send us just enough water so nothing will be wasted. So once upon a time, there came barrels of water which we had to share, but there was never enough and our well was completely dry. Then the barrels stopped coming. The good men and women forgot their promise, so our village began drying up even the wombs of our women. But by that once upon a time I already had two children, a boy and a girl, and they made me weep. Once upon a time as our village turned brown, our animals began to die, then our children. Do you understand what this means? So once upon a time all the husbands sought the good men and women to demand that they keep their promise. The mothers like me had to stay home to watch our children die. While once upon a time my husbands walked to the horizon and never came back. There were rumours of fires that sprouted along the way. Once upon a time. Chochuli's long and heartbreaking tale is interrupted again and again by the woman's tears, which slowly fill the cave, and which were what drew Binabi and Amidea to the cave in the first place. The locust on Amidea's forehead led the girls to the cave drawn by the water, but not as a source of sustenance. Instead, it drinks up Chochuli's song to repeat it as a form of bearing witness and perhaps accusation towards the five kingdoms. The witness of Chochuli in particular also hints at the added criticism the novel subtly raises towards the country or countries receiving refugees – Namely, that they are directly responsible for the plight that leads them to seek better futures away from home. 
It is precisely the good men and women from the five kingdoms who have taken away the village's resources under the pretense of caring for them and distributing them more fairly. This is a clear reference to the Western world having been one of the main motors of climate change, which, as of now, is most likely to negatively impact the lives of people in the non-Western world. More than that, it also reflects a certain attitude by many Western environmentalists that seems to assume that it's the West which is now most engaged in the protection of the environment and sometimes even has to step in to prevent allegedly harmful traditional practices, when in reality uh, Western people still are among the chief polluters of the planet and many, many traditional societies are doing quite a lot of work to keep the planet safe. Herero also picks up on that particular criticism and states that Bobus uses fantasy as a weapon, not only to humanize the other as embodied by all those dispossessed communities fighting for survival beyond the border, but also to question the Western anthropocentric humanist belief that so-called civilized societies can deal with nature and the rest of culture and human beings as they please, that these civilized humans are the only rational and therefore superior beings. Establishing the authoritarian five kingdoms, ostensibly a fantasy kingdom as well as a somewhat dystopian society, as the entity here which tries to manage the world's resources under the pretense of caring, serves to highlight the fact that this kind of behavior is questionable at best. If the five kingdoms is rightly criticized for it, then the Western countries in our everyday life should be questioned for it too, despite the democratic and so-called enlightened nature. Bobus employs the speculative elements, the fantasy if you will, to sharpen the conflict between refugees and receiving countries into one between the stateless strays and wasters on the one hand and the five kingdoms, really a singular entity despite its name, on the other. It is through the use of fantasy and speculation that Melinda Bobus manages to push extremes. Drafts and fears over widespread desertification have culminated in a state of existence where desert is the most common landscape and famine is all that the wastes have ever known. The contrast between insiders and outsiders could not be any more blatant. The five kingdoms are fertile and green, filled with the privileged and the occasional underprivileged person needed to keep the kingdoms working, especially in the form of desert women essentially forced into prostitution, whereas everything else is an arid hellscape. And furthermore, everyone outside the five kingdoms is essentially a stateless refugee, since the five kingdoms are literally the only state around, and access to their citizenship is nearly impossible for outsiders. These conditions are, to be sure, extremes, but they are not unrealistic or mere fancy. On the contrary, they are merely the heightened or perhaps accelerated version of what is already happening today. Perhaps one could argue fantasy is used by Bobus to speed up what Robert Nixon calls slow violence, thus rendering it more visible. And such visibility is indeed highly necessary if we are to prevent the climate dystopia and the ultimate refugee crisis depicted in Locust Girl from coming into existence. <laughs>